Pickathon universe. Welcome to Pickathon Podcast. This is episode 39, which is kind of crazy. My name is Zale Schoenborn. I am your host. I'm the founder of the Pickathon Festival. Then this is a podcast kind of usually about creative discovery and whatever kind of random universes and worlds and conversations we end up in. I don't know. I always learn something and things usually happen that are fun that I just never expect. So wish us luck. And today my guest is in a second is going to be Addie Oasis. She's an incredible soul artist that comes from an incredible background. One of my favorite records of 2023. One of my artists I'm looking forward to most this year. And we'll talk about it in a minute. But what what was kind of coming up for me when we thought about having this, this discussion was was a vibe. And, you know, for us, vibe is such like the the word. Um, I, I maybe overuse it because I always think about everything we do and everything that I like is it feels like a, a, a good vibe or a place where I want to go. And, and we've always run this festival in this kind of irrational way that it was more important to us, like how it felt to us than actually the business in a weird way, like it had to be both. And if we had to make a choice forever when we're making Pickathon, it was the vibe wins. And and if we could never figure it out, I just, we had to keep coming back. And for me, that's like a personal, it's like as a musician, you know, I'm, I'm also a musician and I think of, you know, things that are super personal at first, like this is an expression of what you know, I feel and what we think and what, how we want it to people to like understand um, what as us as artists are kind of creating, whether it's music. And in a case of a festival, like it just breaks my heart in America. We always talk about the, how everything is a, such a hardcore business bottom line and vibe is usually the thing that just goes. And what you get is like, I got to see this artist. It's the biggest artist. I've, you know, they're coming through, I'm going to spend this money and everybody knows that that's going to happen. And so the the vibe is just like second and third. They're like, screw the vibe. Or just the artist might bring a cool show and try to make it happen. But if the producer and the venue has chain link fence up and charging you a million dollars for water and it's hot, there's just nothing you're going to be able to really do besides maybe remember you had an it was an amazing performance. For me, the the venue and the place and how you treat people and how the treat the artists it's like how you get magic to happen. It's it's so it's such common sense. Would you ever have somebody over and eat in your parking spot? Like eat outside? Like hey, let's go have lunch in our garage on our driveway. You know, like with next. It's just so stupid to me that that's how things are. And for us, it kind of goes in so many directions. And you know, all of the spaces this year, we haven't really talked about it that much, but we, we're doing this design build. We have like seven venues at a small festival like that caps this audience at almost as many as many stages as, uh, as all the big festivals. But each of our stages, we kind of like put a huge team of artists and we design build kind of architectural site specific things in nature. And it's like the most fun you can have as a human watching if you can get these teams together and it's taken us forever to get them. And we'll talk more about them. Famous architects, designers, artists, one from France. All these things come together in this incredible expression of vibe that they each one of them you could be lost in and stay at Pickathon. And if you've never been, it's super hard to describe, but I would just tell you that it's it's an experience and like. One of the really core things we just got done and what will happen, I think, when this thing, this podcast is released is the schedule is coming out. And oh, my God, that we take it seriously. We so we are so nerdy about our seven stages and that we spend a month drinking beers, hanging out, playing, whatever. We're just arguing about vibe. And like we have this kind of general rules with our schedule. It's like we call it schedule Sudoku. It takes like five of five people or more whoever wants to you know wants to play this game it's so here's the rules across stages you cannot have the same music can't have this you can't have the same vibe across it on the same stage you cannot have the same music either before or after so if you're looking for some r&b and soul then you're gonna have to like move it's gonna be there it's all over the festival but you just gotta like you gotta follow it and, and if you're looking for 
country, same thing. There's no country stage. It's like it's going to be everywhere. But that's the fun. Is like you sit down and you you think about what do you want to see late night in the galaxy barn? What do you want to see out of the last stage in the paddock? What do you want to see in these different things? And it's this emotional, deep feeling of like knowing that this into that and it's going to be incredible and setting up these impossible choices where you don't care where you're at. In the end, if we do a really good job, it's always it's a classic piece of feedback we get is that you sometimes might sit at a stage and never leave. And that's okay. Spend the entire time in the woods or the galaxy barn or the paddock. And then at the end of the day, you thought you had the best festival and no one else could have possibly had as good a festival as you. And you probably saw a lot of music that you thought you didn't like, but now you do. Because you're you because you just saw something that blew you out of the water, <laughs> and that's just you know, I don't know. Vibe can go on forever. We could have day long conversation on vibe, but I'm going to let folks know. I don't know if this is going to be ahead of that schedule or not, but my guest Addy Oasis is here, and, and I'll tell you where one place she is going to be, and she's going to close out Thursday night in our in the epic Galaxy Barn. Welcome, Addy. Hi. Thank you. You don't even know this yet, but we're putting you in a spot that is that um, Kamasi Washington's first show at a festival was in the, was in this Galaxy Barn on Thursday night at one in the morning. It's an epic spot. Oh, that's cool. And Ghost Note, do you know Ghost Note? Mm-hmm. They also played there. It's in it's a awesome. it's a. It's a small, like two or three hundred person venue that is so emotionally charged, uh, and we have kind of this overflow outside. But it's like I don't know. You're gonna I hopefully love it. It's gonna have so much love coming at you. <laughs> it's called Galaxy. I can only love it. Yes. <laughs> well, welcome. Where Thank Where you. are you today? Are you in New York right now? Or yeah, I'm I'm in Brooklyn at home. Awesome. I feel like you could have a if, if there was such thing as a, a visual podcast. You could just mm-hmm. do like release my reactions to this introduction, <laughs> like the faces I made with all these beautiful little nuggets of cool things you said. I think that would Thank come you. a long way. People would watch that because <laughs> I made yeah. crazy faces of enthusiasm. I know. I mean, you've you've gotten to play. I'm guessing a pl- lot of places. Like, what what's your feeling? Do you think like the some places you probably play, you feel lots of venues give you love and some are, they just, it's a show, right? It's Yeah, I mean, I have like, I, with the, some of what you said rang so much to me. Uh, it's And, you know, knowing that a festival cares about how they treat artists, you'd be surprised. It's not always the same. Uh, I will yeah. never say <laughs> names, but, you know, the, some <laughs> countries you're treated better than others. Uh, oh, yeah. And... Yeah, and uh, America is definitely not at the top. Not so you guys are gonna make up for the rest of us. It's just kind of sad. It's just like you. It's like a business in America, right? Yeah, it's like in like other countries. It's like the top of the pyramid, and people support it. Like the gov- everybody supports it, right? It's like that's. I don't. I just don't understand why in America it's so tough. <laughs> well, you <laughs> just said it. It's because it's a business. America is a bu- it's, it's about business first. You know. Yeah. And and like there's very few of the independent festivals left. I mean, but yeah. you you weren't born in Brooklyn. You were actually tell tell us where you were born. I'm from France, which is why I have this uh, this speech, which is why I'm comparing <laughs> because I'm I'm American now. I've actually been here for a very long time, but I was born and raised in France. Uh, and you know, I've gotten to play a lot of festivals in France lately, and it's different. It's different. They're incredible, right? I I hear I hear I, the visuals. Everything I see in France is blows me away. These like I don't know how much so much art in, can be created in one spot. You know what I'll say that I just I just finished tour in France actually, and there's one thing that I noticed is slightly unrelated but not that I loved. That one of the highlights of my last tour is how many female lighting engineers I've met. Oh wow, that was so cool, and the lighting was so because I I didn't have my own lighting person and Mm -hmm. the lighting was so cool for all the shows that I've done and I was like wow these engineers are like real and on top of it they were women so I I'm not saying anything here without saying it (laughs) 
But I'm no, saying okay. it. And there's a lot of things, box that are checked. Is hiring women in these jobs? Is uh, hiring people that are really good at their jobs? Right. And caring. We always say that too. It's like a weird thing in America that most festivals are like. 80% dudes like you know yes. like I don't understand we're, we've always somehow ended up around 50% female artists that's amazing but it's like it's it's not because we like it it's a goal but only because there's that much amazing like female there's like female and male music like it's not like it's not hard to find right it's yeah. not hard to find so like we're, like it's not like a thing like you're like oh we're gonna do this we're like no it's actually you just have to be kind of like in the in the space of like finding the best music you know yeah that's how we feel about it <laughs> yeah you gotta do your work do your research what was it like growing up in uh were you in france what was that like well i don't know another place to grow up so i can't really tell you you know compared to anything but it was well, like Amer imagine you grew up versus like growing up in the states like what's that is it is it feel like you since you've been here you know i feel i feel like i'll say i feel like i have the best of both worlds and i really like uh that indiana ended up having this experience of like starting life in, in France and then becoming an adult in America. Going back mm -hmm. to what we said earlier, like America is a business and France is more about like nurturing and culture. And I think I was very lucky that I had that had it in that order. Yeah. In terms of the values that I got, but also, you know, we're not like the quickest at business and we're not the most like the best at selling ourselves, for instance. Um, we're right. really shy when it comes to that. So becoming an artist uh, in the U.S. was was a was a good thing for me to be able to say like I want to be a star I want to do this and get on stage and not care about people's opinions we're not as good as that and at, at doing that in France but we are um, I just I yeah I loved uh, I love I love that I'm from there I love it I love I love my experience I guess do you still go back do you still have friends and I was just there yeah just toward friends that's awesome did you start learning I mean I I read that you were in a choir at five was that yeah so my experience growing up in France is is you know we all have a singular experience but a, a lot of my experience came from my parents and their backgrounds my dad is from the Caribbean a Caribbean mm -hmm. island called Martinique in the West Indies yep and my mom is from uh, the countryside in the south of France. So I spent a lot of time in both of these places that combined with Paris give me such a wide range of like cultures and languages. Oh, yeah. Um, but I started singing when I was two. I mean, I have there are recordings of me singing when I was like barely talking. Um, and I have <laughs> siblings, three older siblings that also all sing and play instruments. And I think that comes a lot from like my dad's culture, like our Caribbean background of like everybody sings and dances kind of not everybody, yeah. but in our family, we did. Did everybody play instruments or did you learn instruments from your family or? Uh, no one, no one is a professional, but my, uh, my older brother plays guitar and uh, he was my influence in starting guitar. For sure. And so you actually started on guitar, not bass, right? I started with singing first and played a little bit of keys when I was little. And then I picked up a guitar when I was a teenager because I started writing songs and I needed to like an instrument to write. And then it's only after I moved to New York that I um, that I started playing bass. Which you were there all the way, like you started college, right? In, in Paris? I did one year of college in Paris and then... Um, I sat and don't listen to me if you're a kid, if you're if you're 18, <laughs> turn it off. But uh, don't turn it off, actually. But I, I uh, sat in class one day and realized that I was only here for a, a plan B. And I was like, well, there's no there's no losing if I don't have a plan B, because then I have like instead of 50 50, it's 100 percent chances of making it. And I never went back to school and I moved to New York. That's wild. So you literally just kind of, did you have connections in New York? Was there something that you were able to like? I knew one person. It's always good. You always need one anchor. <laughs> so I knew one guy who was a director who lived in Paris for a year, who was from New York. And going back to what I was saying earlier, like he gave me that like American, like 
you can do this speech that we don't have in France. France, we're like a lot more skeptical. It's like, ah bon, uh, tu veux, uh, you want to be a singer? <laughs> ah bon, uh, who do you think you are? Kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> and he saw me perform once. He's like, oh my God, you're such a star. You got this. You know, like the real American, especially in New York. Yep. <laughs> uh, mentality that I like, that was uh, infectious in the moment. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Okay, I'll fall, I'll do this. Uh, and he connected me with his neighbor who uh, had immigrated from Paris also mm -hmm. uh, when he was 22 and didn't had come alone and uh, knew what it was like. And, and he was like, maybe you can stay with him. Hey, he can maybe give let you sleep on his couch. So I speak to this man that I have never met. Uh, and he was like, yeah, you can stay with me. And I was oh like, okay, God. I was 19. Just like packed up everything. Yeah, like <laughs> none of this is a red flag at all. No. Um, and I'm <laughs> sitting on the plane and this woman next to me was really nice. She was like, I'm telling her this story. And she's like, wait, you are, you, you are going where? And so she said, <laughs> I'm giving you my number just in case. She was like, this girl is about to get <laughs> murdered probably. And she <laughs> gave me her number. I never used it because you know what? I landed in the house of my now big brother, the protector that comes for me whenever there's anything going down. And it was the best encounter I've ever met in my life. And, uh, this wow. guy named Boris is now my big, my like literally my dad considers him a son. That is incredible. So yeah. you just like had good connections there, like to land in a safe spot. I landed in a safer spot. That script sounds terrible. Like, you it know, sounds that bad. sounds, it sounds really bad. Like my, I have a daughter now. I'll be like, girl, hell no. You are not. What? <laughs> I need no, to interview uh, this person. We need to like do a background check. What? Yeah, I, I know. I mean, he did. He did. My dad called and he did speak to my dad and he was like, don't worry. I'm not a psychopath. Um, I don't know why <laughs> just that was enough for my dad either. But it could all go back to the fact that I started touring when I was, you know, I started touring when I was six years old and toured my whole childhood until I was about 13 and we got on a bus for a month every July and a bunch of kids and toured around friends. So I had that independence. I had that, I'm packing my bag, I'm going to make music, I'll peace out, see you later. Um, independence that I built from being a traveling performing kid. On a, in a choir? Was that the choir? It was a choir. Like, uh, like, Church music choir, medieval choir, like what is it? Medieval. <laughs> we don't have like church gospel in France, so it wasn't that. It was just, it was a choir, but it was also part like theater. So we were singing and dancing. A lot of the singing was like mm -hmm. traditional friends that we doubled with some bad gospel here and there. <laughs> uh, and it was a part of the show where it was like, it was a it was musical. It was like very Broadway inspired too. So I sang wow. and danced. Okay, so... Coming back to the your so you, Boris, you came you, you you dropped in to to live with this person you never really met right because this was just a, I had this never was just met like, him at all but I was only coming for two weeks at first really I had a return, okay I did have a return ticket it wasn't like a a moving there at first but after five days I decided to stay which also sounds stupid but I didn't what stay. what could have happened in five days did you have like an awesome like like experience or what was it like it's the magic of new york you know mm -hmm. it's new york it's it's like no other place new york it still inspires me just as much to this day and new york has that thing that makes you feel like everything is possible because it truly is in new york anything is possible i mean but you had to compare against paris so like i actually have never been to paris so what's the difference like they're huge both huge cities well i grew up in the projects i grew up in a poor neighborhood low income low mid mid you know middle class low income families mostly immigrants uh a lot of flavor a lot of cultures i loved a lot of it most of it but it's not like growing up in Paris, like, you know, my I did not have a privileged family or life mm -hmm, at all growing up. Mm -hmm. So I never really I've never really lived in Paris. I still yet have to have that experience of living in the city in Paris. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so for me, I mean, I was a city girl because I was at by the time by that time I was a teenager and I was hanging out in the city all the time. I was taking the train every day and roaming around the streets of fancy Paris. Um, but it was still a new thing for me to live in a 
cool city, not in the projects. And when you were in college, were you in Paris? Like, did you get a little bit of a feeling? No. No. Still, I was still in the same place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And just New York was just more accessible, like right away, like coming in, dropping in, because you didn't probably didn't come with a ton of money either. So you're just like... <laughs> I had $700. Right. right. I, I remember mean, specifically so, yeah, that I saved up from working at a restaurant. That's super cool. So it's just like, you just felt the vibe. Right. Is that what you just, you I just felt kind the of... vibe. And you know, when you're 19, it's, it's like, you don't think about like the future has, is such an open-ended thing where it's like, I knew I could always come back whenever. So I wasn't thinking at the time, like, oh, I'm going to be like a few years down the line. Like now I'm like married with kids and live here, but that's not what I was thinking <laughs> about. I was thinking of just <laughs> tomorrow, you know, like when you're, when you're 19, it's just tomorrow. It's the only exactly. thing that matters. And that's a great way to live. It doesn't last long, but. I know. I have a 20 year old and a 17 year old. <laughs> Ooh. Just turned 20 year old. So uh, I can that's tell fun. you, yes, they are. It is the moment. Mm -hmm. What do you, what was your blueprint? You moved in a new city. What do you do? How do you make a living? Like what? Uh, I worked as a waitress mm -hmm. and then I, which I was already doing in Paris. And then I started bartending because I realized that waitressing, I had a boss and I didn't really like it because I was a terrible waitress. So I started bartending um, and little by little, I like also like started working on music very quickly. I was going to open mics and just meeting everybody that I could possibly meet. Um, and, you know, that's where I, I really learned the power of manifesting. Manifesting, mm -hmm. that's why I, I put that into practice. Like, I realized the more people I would talk to about my dream uh, and my next goal, the, the, it, it, things were starting to really happen. Um, and that's another thing in New York is, like, everything's so here. Like, manifestation happens in real life. But in New York, you have so many more opportunities that it, it it's, like, faster. I've always felt like a life a year in New York is like three years outside of New York of how much you oh, can yeah. get done, which is why we're yeah. tired and crazy, you know. <laughs> and now you have kids, so you're even more tired and crazy. <laughs> and guess guess where my husband is from? Where? Portland. No way. That's really? right. He is. No way. Yep. Oh, my God. So do you You must visit here. <laughs> I visit there a lot. My pa my in-laws live there still. Where Where at? I can't remember the name of the neighborhood. It's like my, I asked my my father-in-law the other day. I was like, what is your neighborhood called? I can tell you. I probably, I, I'm i like, uh, I mean, obviously I'm here now, but I am would totally know. It'd be hilarious if they live close to us. <laughs> and it, I'm over by the Alberta neighborhood, it's on, which is... It's, yeah, I think it's right there, Northeast Garfield. Oh, yeah, right here. You're, like, right there. I <laughs> wow. totally know where it is. That's awesome. So he grew up... He was born in Illinois, but moved to Oregon when he was 12, like, 10 years old or something, and then moved to Portland. Uh, so he went to that middle school and high school in Portland. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Yeah. And then you guys yeah, yeah. met in New York. Yeah, he's also a New Yorker. He's been in New York for a long time also, longer than me. He's a little older, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, we met here. That's awesome. So what was like the first music thing you guys stumbled into? You're like 19. You're like, what was like, how... What was the first manifestation that actually came to be? Well, that, you know, I've learned, I learned from that time too, um, that it was this interesting chain of like through every, any, every person I met, I could connect it, connect it directly to the next thing that happened or the next person I met. Mm -hmm. And that guy, Boris, that I told you about was actually like, he's a very talented chef and now has a restaurant that's very successful in Brooklyn, but he was also a party guy and super connected at the time. <laughs> and he knew a lot of people in the, mu in the music business. And he like, I remember he brought me to a friend of his studio and then that guy introduced me to another guy. And then that guy introduced me to another, by the way, I wish I was saying that girl, but especially at the time, producers are always dudes, which we're working on mm -hmm. changing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was kind of that chain of events. And, you know, from working in nightlife and meeting people who were a lot of them, were a lot of BS, but also working in restaurants and just being out and just telling every single person that I was doing music and going to some amazing open mics and jam sessions in New York. And very quickly, I started meeting people. Yeah, like t timing is kind of everything, right? Like somebody's probably needed a 
um, a band or something, right? Did you ever, did you finally like find the, like a band that was looking for a member or? You know, the, the, or did the, you start a band? The big, well, the biggest thing for me wasn't to meet the people, but to be good, to become mm-hmm. better, to be a better mm-hmm singer at the time a better like that was really my quest that truthfully and all jokes aside like the reason why i wanted to stay in new york is because the level of musicianship was insane and i was crazy enough to believe that i could get to their level um and i just i was looking for myself i didn't have a a sound i didn't have a identity really as an artist or as a writer and the more people i met the more i started to shape myself and very quickly, that. yeah, after about two years or less, I, I formed my first band, my first group called The Crowd. The Crowd, yeah. <laughs> I was trying it to was, find some recordings. <laughs> it, it sounded pretty good. We were like, it was a trio. We were kind of like trying to be the next Fugees. Uh, yeah. Of course, that did not happen. Um, <laughs> and but that I learned a lot about songwriting. I learned a lot about producing at the time, about performing, um, and that's when I started playing bass from that group. From that group, yeah, it's really wild when you, you know, you have that. Even when you're manifesting, I'm thinking like I'm going to do this. You don't really know what you don't have it. You know, you have to kind of like go out and experiment with it, right? And things, some things work and some things don't. And you're like, I like this sound. I don't like this. I'm guessing that 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 was like happening in real time for you in this time all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, until really when I picked up the bass, it gave me a lot of the answers I, I, up to some questions I had, uh, which was really like, who am I as an artist? It's gotta be a good story. So like, you you're playing guitar in the band or you're singing and then you did how did you just pick up the bass <laughs> the bass player we hired for a show canceled no way <laughs> yeah he canceled because he had a gig with uh michelle and deggio cello i think or amel larue at oh. the time i can't remember uh, oh, but he man. had a good reason good stuff <laughs> yeah good yes. stuff. again that's new york like you'll be with musicians that are playing you know um and i played guitar and the guys were like, hey, Addy, you play guitar. Why don't you just play bass? It was their idea. Like, literally, they take all the credit. Uh, and they were like, yeah, why don't you just grab the bass? Because we can't play the bass. We're playing guitar and drums. And we don't, <laughs> like, why don't you? And just, they, I grabbed the bass and uh, my life changed. You, It's just like you knew it, right? When you were playing it? I knew like, it. Or did you it. just know. Really? You just know. You, it's like, like it's like falling in love. It's like harder to play than you think. But it doesn't matter. Like it's like <laughs> it's not about how hard it is, and that's how you know you love something. Everything's difficult when you start when you're serious about it. Like relationships. Like yeah, you know, I met my husband. I knew he was the one. I was not looking for a husband, but I was like, that's it. Like you just know <laughs> some things. You just know, and I just and I I compared to the feeling I got when I was playing guitar too was very different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just, I don't know, I can't explain. I, just, I always loved the bass. I just never thought about playing it. Again, back to my feminist agenda, very often we don't encourage girls to play these instruments. I never really, it didn't even occur to me, just like producing. It's like, well, I didn't think about it because I don't have examples. Exactly. After the crowd, right, was like the next, what was the next little phase that happened? It was Escort, which was my, was my new disco band that I didn't start. Uh, I joined when I was uh, still in the crowd, actually, and I was doing both. But Escort was more like these guys wrote an album and they're hiring me to sing on it. Um, Mm -hmm. And then it became more of a thing live. And then the crowd ended and it just the transition was pretty seamless to really becoming like the face of Escort after that. And then I added the bass to to the shows for Escort. What did what was that that period like for you? That was the period where I really developed myself as a performer. We played mm-hmm. a lot of shows, we played a lot of festivals, uh, and it was the kind of music that I needed to experience live to understand a lot of things about my performing style. Uh, like the crowd was more hip hop soul and this was like new disco dance music and like the beasts in me got un- completely unleashed. And that was the second <laughs> answer I was looking for, that was the second piece of the puzzle, you know, that we, now we have the bass, now we have the funk and the disco and the like high energy on stage, roaring beast. We're getting close now. We're getting close. I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, I mean, you actually, from that point where you were like, 
that was kind of where your first EP kind of came out pretty close to then, right? And this was when you were in in your previous name. So I'm, I just butchered it in the intro. So you didn't Adeline. butcher it. Adeline. You just made it American. Yeah, it's Adeline. Uh, that was quite some time after. I was for a while. For a while, I was the, with Escort. That was a few years, and I was doing some gigs yeah. as a bass player on the side. I was also on a TV show, playing in a house band for two years. Wait, what was TV show? What was that? Um, do you know that NBC host Meredith Vieira? Mm. She used to be the host for The Millionaire. She was on a Today Show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. She had her own. She had her own talk show for for two seasons on NBC, and they they had a they hired a house band. It was a house band of all girls fronted by a man um, <laughs> yeah but he's he's the sweetest and he's gay so it's different he, he, he can't. He's, he's one of us he's one of us um but yeah it was a great experience we were at 30 rock i had to get up at five o'clock in the morning every oh day to go day job to the, it was a day job it was a very well-paying job it's a great it was a great gig and it was another big you know learning experience for me uh, and from there, I met CeeLo Green, who I started playing with, and I started playing for other artists, wow. too. And yeah, so I, I, I had I was the lead singer of Escort. But, you know, that the reality of it is and I, I like to share that shamelessly for people to know and and, you know, aspiring artists. It takes a while to took a while for me to pay my bills as as an artist, like with just my music. I was lucky enough that I was paying my bills with music for a long time, but I was singing for weddings, I was singing for private parties, I was playing for other artists, um, you know, it took a long time. You were on a TV show? I was on a TV show, which was, that was good money, but that didn't last too long. I know, it's totally, it's, a, it's the case. It's, I always give that advice, like, people look, when something appears successful, they're like, ah, I'm like, well, the trick is surviving to get there. Like, you gotta yeah. just, like, the passion is like constant. Like I, I feel like when I had kids, um, the festival for me kind of became my musical. Um, out, you know, I had the bands playing music on my for most of my life, either trumpet or I got into like American kind of kind of country bluegrass stuff, playing mandolin. But I was just like a jazz nice. trumpet player all my whole high school. Then I had a kid, and I was like, God, I can't stay out till two in the morning anymore. And like stay up all night too. It was so hard. And so I had a day job and I kept that. But the, you know, the the music that that this festival, which was tiny, it was like a couple hundred people. Wow. But it just the passion of doing it over and over and not have to live off it, taking all that pressure, making it all about the vibe, just like keeping the kind of creative energy that I always knew had to be like a core part of life. Like for me, like that. There needs to be something that is this expression, this creativity, this kind of collaboration, just that I I wouldn't be able to have like a really fulfilling life without that. But if you rewind like 20 years, 24 years ago, we looked tiny. And now you look at us now and people are like, oh, pick it on. I'm like, well, the secret isn't really like now. And it's not it's just like it's like I somehow I survived 20 years. Right. It's that it's like where I'm guessing like where you are, like people would say, oh, I want to do what you do. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you got 20 years, then go for it. I mean, it, that's about how long it's taken for me also, because I started, I mean, I started performing when I was five years old. So, you yeah. know, it's it's been a long time of doing this. Um, and yeah, you just, it's really about that. And I'm still not there, you know, I'm still not rich and, and I still have, so much to say about where we are now as musicians and and the lack of uh financial support we get you know oh yeah it's america it goes back to that again <laughs> back to that but also you know i'll say the streaming world now that we you know i started in the music business before that was a thing and mm-hmm. you know a lot of people from our generation we started hoping that we would start selling records and now that we're successful we're not selling records where people are listening to our music for free so what are we supposed to do now um that's a big question mark you know if this was 
if this was the 90s or the early 2000s, with the millions of streams I have, I would be rich today. But I'm poor yeah. from from a the standpoint of how much m money I'm making with my music that I write myself. Um, yeah. If it wasn't for performing, I couldn't pay my bills. And that's I know not okay. It's crazy, isn't it? I, I can, we can have a whole show on that too. That's, that's a whole just, podcast. Yeah. It just drives me nuts. Like at the extent that you have to like add all these extra things to be successful, you know, when, when, yeah, I mean, there's just, again, there's just, it's just not valued in the same way. You just, everything has to be a business here. It's just so hardcore, you know, and especially when you have something incredible. I mean, in some ways you're lucky because you are not in other bands. You're probably not doing wedding gigs anymore, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. But it is a, we are a business and I think we are being overlooked. We are seen as commodity artists mm -hmm. in America. We're not seen as a, a business like I am a business entity and you know I just experienced having a child while being a musician there's no mater maternity leave there's no job there's no funding there's no help like what are we supposed to do like it's almost like people are forgetting that we are people oh my god that is so true um and we have AI that's starting to make music so what oh, are we no. going to do? You want to just listen? Because if we can't, if you're going to listen to my art for free, if you're going to consume my art indefinitely for free, um, and also at the same time we have AI that's making music, that's going to get paid just as much as us. Um, what is going to happen to actual artists? Thank God for people like you who put festivals together. It's all about the live. I think it's just this, you know, it's kind of weird. I think I... I hope that that's an. I hope that that stays successful because it's really the last real place where you got Less, you have yeah. all the control, right? You have all of the. I do, but what do I do when I'm pregnant? What do I do when I'm on maternity leave and not getting paid for five months? You know what? I totally. You know that's that's what makes me think we had this brief moment of like success as an industry a little bit, and the artists. I mean, the venues did, and I don't know if the artists shared in it as much as the venues, like the Neva. You know, I don't know. COVID was crazy for us, right? Mm -hmm. To have all this like stuff, pay all these people and like survive with no, no income at all. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's the same for you. If you know, like there should, it just makes so much common sense that if we valued this, that there would be a way to have maternity leave, to not be on tour. Like when you're, it just, it just drives me nuts that that is because I do believe in this, in the United States, like people value the crud out of art, right? They think of it, they, it's, it's passionate to them. They don't think about how they're consuming it or how it's like, it's sustainable, right? It goes, it just, but I do, you know, I, I know from everyone I, that, that, that music is such a important thing in America. <laughs> in America? Oh, yeah. And it's not, it's not the people's fault, you know, we're just consumers mm -mm. and we're going to take what what's convenient i mean listen you we were talking i just buzzed in my amazon delivery like it's i know that i'm probably hurting the library at the cor or the corner store so it's you know it's it's i'm never going to blame anybody for streaming my, my music please keep streaming because the bigger the numbers it won't be a problem when you hit the billions then it, you actually make a really good living uh but it's I'm, I'm continuing that speech as i'm growing because i i'm probably so going to tip to the other side soon. And I don't want to forget people that are at the level I'm at today, you know, like, I know what are they going to do? I don't want to be like, oh, but I don't care. Now I'm rich. So I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it goes back to like, I just, yeah, that whole, that whole journey too. So like, if you ever do get to that spot, it's like, it's because you went through so much of the, of the in-between and it's just so few people I think can make it through that you know, the hustle, because yeah. the hustle's real. It's real. The hustle is like so real. And it's like, you just have, you have to have the energy and the spirit and the, and the resilience to like, you know, as much success as there is. And you have to also be, I mean, I would say for myself, I enjoy the business aspect of my career. I very much consider myself a businesswoman. I consider my manager, my partner, uh, mm -hmm. my business partner. And so same with my label. Um, 
And I think that that's, I'm lucky that I'm that way with business. You know, if you hate it, you hate it. But you, I think that's a big part of it. Now we have to be on our business today. We really have to be on it. Totally. And, you know, I want to kind of cover kind of your arc because I think it's fascinating because there is, there's a, there's so much growth I can tell and changes you went through. And I like over like all of the, all of the previous records you made up to now, up to, to, to where you're at today. So you were in escort, then you decided to, you're motivated. I'm going to release my first EP. Was that, was a plan to be, or a rec, it was a record. No, I did a whole album, which was a terrible idea. It was a bad idea to Why? make a whole, don't, don't start with an album because it was too much. And like albums really, like it really takes a lot of, it's like a big moment. It's like going to the Olympics. It's like, yeah. So it's like, you don't start with the Olympics. You start with a championship. You start with it. like, I love it. And I started with the Olympics. No, that was not. I was the guy I ended up with zero medals and I did not deserve him. It's fine. It's fine. Like it's, yeah, that's, that would be my best. Uh, yeah. When you gear up for the, an album, it's really like going to the World Cup or the Olympics. But you don't know, like you're, you know, this, so this is 2018. This was like mm-hmm. six years ago or probably more than that when you did the record, right? I, I started, yeah, yeah, it was about, it was about. 17, 18, I made it pretty quickly. But you don't know it's the Olympics, no, right? Know. You don't, you're like, I can do this. And so I, I knew, I knew, but I was stubborn. And it's because I had so much music in me and I was frustrated as yeah. a writer from being an escort and having men control the scenario and the narrative of that music mm-hmm. and not letting me sing. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're probably going to be mad at me for that, but whatever. They, they've already heard me speak up about it. Uh, like not being able to, write the way I want and for their defense it was a group not about me so I just had so much to say I had so much music so many ideas um that I just I had I had to it was it had to be 18 songs or 14 I can't remember how many it was too many songs (laughs) too many I mean and you you that was in uh 18 and then you actually released another one into Ryan's right in July 2020, which was COVID. It was supposed to be coming out in May, and then I moved. I moved it back because of COVID. Because of Black Lives Matter and yeah, what was going on on the streets, and my focus was on that. And and yeah, yeah. crazy times. I know that almost seems unreal right now. <laughs> yeah, it seemed unreal at the time too. It felt like being in an episode of um, Black Mirror. Oh, that was just the the kind of like connection felt really strong like i just felt like people were really waking up and having these conversations which was really awesome and just so much potential for change everything felt kind of optimistic even though it felt bleak at the same time like i don't know if you had you yeah know. absolutely yeah absolutely and for like us like the on the venue side that that's where i thought maybe we'll band together as independent artists and venues and we're gonna have our voices heard and like all these changes are going to happen. And it, it actually kind of started, you know, Neva was a cool thing for um, yeah. definitely 100% for uh, the kind of venue side on the, during COVID. Thank God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but, it, you know, I wish it had lasting things now. Like, I feel we're yeah. back <laughs> to, to where we were. Um, we are, you pretty know? much. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like for as an artist over COVID for you? Were you? It was. Um. It was not bad, because I, at the time of that time in my career, I needed to develop both my um, ticket sales and my my live show and and also the writing and my and my my listenership and I got to one had to be paused and in the end I, I was able to focus on one at a time and develop one at a time, which was mm-hmm. very beneficial for me. That's awesome. So you had just kind of like that workshop kind of intro. intro. I kind of skipped over the phase of like performing for 40 people, if I'll say, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I just released an AP. I'm going to go on tour and just like lose money because that's another thing uh, and just go and bleed money opening for somebody mm-hmm. getting a hundred dollars a night. Like I skipped mm-hmm. over that because I released two EPs and then by the time it was time for me to perform again, I was at a decent level. Oh, that's in terms of my ridiculous. Following. That's kind of nice. That's a whole yeah. like level up before you had to deal with that level up. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because that's a struggle, like to going on for a hundred bucks. Exactly what you said. <laughs> yeah. 
for like 200 and first 50 person rooms for the whole tour. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, and so like you actually ch- decided to kind of change your from Adeline. Right? Adeline, Adeline. Adeline. I'm going to get it. That is why. But that's I'm why put I changed two E's. it. It's fine because you never have to call me that. That's why I changed it. Adeline to Addy. <laughs> yeah. But it was got to be more than that. It wasn't just changing, right? It had. To, I'm guessing just hearing this narrative that you were you were changing and developing or something was going on. What, is it, am I right? Is there any kind of? Well, that was the last piece of the puzzle. I, I had developed my sound, I had developed my image and my, yeah, basically these two things. And I just, the name never fit me. People were saying Adeline, it's Adeline, but I was trying to be stubborn and say, no, you got to pronounce it the French way. And, you know, COVID happened and everything paused. And I just, you, you know, when you're sitting down, you get to really, I just realized I was just really uncomfortable and that it, it just wasn't the stage name I, I wanted. Um, so I thought about reflecting on what we talked about and how like actually like that time, even though it was so bleak, was beneficial in some way for me and realize that a lot of my life works that way. Like I always find good things come out of bad situations and, and that kind of the word oasis came to me. Um, and that's, that's awesome. what the music is to me. That's what I want my music to be to people. And that's, and uh, I became Addy Oasis and I'm so happy about it. It's so it's so interesting because, you know, when I listen kind of through the arc of your music, like there's nothing you did like is is just fully formed as Lotus Glow. I really feel like all these yeah, influences you had and all the other things kind of all get gestated and you baked this incredibly amazing Thank record. Thank you. You know? Thank you. Did it feel like that for you? Like, did it feel like... You did you know it was special? It felt like the beginning. Yeah, that's awesome. I just don't know still that if the music is special, I just know that it's it's the beginning of like of my art of my journey as a like as Addy Oasis. Like now it's like we've had all this growth, we've had all these lessons and we still have so much to learn, but now mm-hmm. the now let's do it like now 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 now, now we're it's like there a, you've got now we're in a race now we can run the Olympics now we're like we're formed we're fully formed so your fit your fifty fifty uh, guess when you were when you were nineteen paid off then <laughs> it did uh, yeah, yeah it 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 did it it really did that's awesome yeah well I I am so excited to have you play at the festival this year and just people to experience the magic you're gonna it's gonna be overwhelming amount of love coming your way and i am and i have family there i love playing in portland you're gonna it's gonna be great so we're super excited and um i am honored to have you today thank you for being my guest thank you for having me and i would speak for hours but i have to relieve my nanny (laughs) that's okay you know, I remember those days. Soon they're going to be 19 making their 50-50 guess of what they're going to be. I love yes. that story. I hope young people listen to this because it's like, don't sit there and just hedge the safe bet. Go for it, right? That's like, go where your dream is. I think the plan B is is putting something in your way uh, to, like, it's, it's just putting something in, in, in your way of attaining your goal. I love it. You're not really going for it if you have a plan B. Plan B is that on the side is like right in front. (laughs) And with that, I'm going to say thank you, everyone. This has been episode 39 with Addy Oasis. And uh, hopefully you have a wonderful universe happening around you for the next week until we join again. Thanks, Addy. (laughs) Thank you, Zale. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Pickathon Podcast. This podcast is produced by Zale Schoenborn, Tanner McCullough, and Evan Throckmorton. Our artwork is by Travis Bone, and additional support by Ryan Stiles. The music you heard in this episode was by our guest of honor, Addie Oasis. The songs included were Before, You Make Me Want It, and the one riding out on right now from the latest deluxe release of Lotus Glow, the French version of Sidonie. Be sure to check out our Pickathon Patreon, where we have exclusive interviews, content, and insights into the Pickathon world. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you hear your podcasts. And tell a friend about where they can get on the Pickathon bandwagon. 
thank you to the whole Pickathon family. And like Zale said, we'll catch you all next week. Son regard sur la vie et sa fille.